Welcome to our next speaker, Tamash, who is, um, I have a couple of notes. So first of all, uh, he was going to be talking to us about the evolutionary origins of coordination on social networks, but he has uh, a favor to ask of you. He would like to make this as an interactive a session as possible, which is a wonderful way uh, for us to make social bridges more interactive. So I'm, 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 all, I'm all for it. Uh, so his request is that if you have questions in uh, during his talk to please, please uh, put those down into the chat. I will be following those and will transmit them as best I can to Tamash in, 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 in as quickly as possible. So Tamash, if I do have a question, I will wave my hand vigorously and interrupt you. Uh <laughs> Thank you. I mean, good luck to, to the idea of interrupting. Like any of my students is gonna be like, oh, that's impossible. Okay, so thank you so very much for the invitation. Um, so I thought what I would discuss uh, with you a little bit is where our drive comes from to build a social network. So we are a very weird species because we build very large and very complex social networks and arguably our, you know, the social brain and the social complexity hypothesis uh, um, shows that, or suggests that, you know, we have this ridiculously expensive uh, neuron computer on the top of our necks so that we can compute the complex society around us. And there's a host of different uh, evidence for that. <clears throat> for instance, we put, we think ourselves always as unique, uh, but always as others, as really categories. You know, we, we always label others, even though we know that you know, they are also special. So um, I thought what I would do is I would show a little bit of how this kind of labeling matters and then how that plays out in modern society. So let me switch to the, to my screen here again. Okay. So these are Yanomamo soldiers in the Amazonas. And there's a very interesting phenomenon that young Yanomamo men uh, often engage with. So these are, these are very warrior cultures, very aggressive cultures. Uh, the children are encouraged to be aggressive. So they, they grow up very ag aggressive. That's the way of interaction. And they're, they're always a, there always is an enemy or several enemy groups. So young men uh, often pair up with each other and go out and kill someone, try to kill an enemy. And if it works, the society, their group gives them a new status. It's called an unokai. Napoleon Shagnon described this. And it's a very interesting, uh, because it's almost like being brothers, blood brothers. Definitely the society sees it as something closer than just friendship. But these men are, are never closely related to each other. They're, even if they are related, they're third, fourth, degree cousins, never immediate relatives. And then this close bond that's created by killing somebody together will be reinforced if they go out again and kill another enemy and, and maybe another enemy. So they become really closely bonded. We don't quite understand the exact mechanism of bonding here, clearly taking a big risk, uh, very high psychological salience, um, shared uh, attention, shared intentionality creates a bond. Some people argue maybe the act of killing someone also contributes to this, but it's, it's not clear. Anyway, they become very closely bonded. And after a while, they marry each other, other's sisters. It's a very patriarchal society, uh, which is really interesting because they turn a, a single dyadic relationship between two people it is something that brings the more distant bits of the social network together via this in-law relationship. So I've been wondering a lot, what exactly is going on here? Because you know, chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest relatives, wouldn't be doing this. So there must be something special going on. And what, what I found, and I, I will show you a little bit how, with a, with a fun experiment, is that the edge type matters. So it is, it is important what our relationships are. So for this, please imagine that you are leaving where you're sitting right now. Hopefully you're sitting on a, on a beach, amazing beach like this. Um, uh, some of my friends 
are sitting there. It's really outrageous. I mean, White and in Oxford. Um, anyway, so let's go to you're planning to go to a beach like this with, with three friends. Your name is Julie, and you're going on a holiday with Tom, Kate, and Pete. So four of you friends are going to go on a holiday. And you get to choose the house. So these are your choices. And the houses, uh, the huts floating on the water differ in that one type of a hut has two rooms with two double beds. And the other type of a hut has a triple bed in one room and a single bed in the other. And you're the one who's choosing the hut. So you need to think about it very carefully. So of course, if you start looking at this, it's not quite clear which one you should really go for. Uh, you need more information, yeah? So that if you just go and look at, look at the heart itself, uh, it's not clear you know, where you would want to be. But here's one more piece of information that, that not only you are choosing the heart, but this, this other person, a friend of yours, Tom, will be choosing who sleeps where. And to be very clear, this holiday is going to be about love. You're arriving with romantic intentions. So which one are you going to choose? Maybe you say, okay, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to choose the one with two double beds. Maybe I get lucky, but clearly you need information. So I give you this little bit of extra information that there's a love graph. There's a, a, a relationship graph uh, there. I said, okay, oh dear, uh, this is really tricky. So maybe I should go for doubles because I better be in the triangle, in which case I want to end up with in the, in the, in the, in the bed in which there are three people. So maybe that's you, you're switching places. Unless I tell you that, oh, oh, sorry, you are the one hanging out. So of course, oh dear, uh, if there's gonna be a, a Tom is choosing uh, the triple bed version, then they will be sleeping there. So you better be in the double beds. You double, better choose the double bed house. So maybe you end up with somebody rather than inevitably sleeping uh, alone. Hmm. Um, so you, are, you end up in the, in the double bed. But then I can also add something else because it's also these relationships can have a direction. So these, let's assume that there are six edges. So you are attracted to Tom, Tom is attracted to you, Tom is attracted to Kate, Kate is attracted to Tom, Kate is attracted to Pete, and Pete is attracted to Tom. And Tom is choosing. So if Tom is choosing the house with double beds, well, you might end up with Pete. With Pete. So you might want to, want to choose the, the triple bed version. Unless I add something else, I add the strength of relationships. So let's say that you are into Tom, Tom is a little bit into you, but Tom is clearly in a relationship, a two-way relationship with Kate. Kate is into a little bit into Pete and Pete is properly into Tom. So suddenly when Tom is choosing clearly in the double bed version, we'll go with Kate. So you might, as, might choose the house with the triple bed because Tom will pick uh, you rather than Pete to go into the triple bed. So then you're gonna choose again, a different one. They're the three bed version. And then let me add one more thing, the characteristic of the nodes. Yeah. So let's say Kate, orange, uh, the, the, the size of the, of the node is, is attractiveness on the mate market. So Kate is a little bit not attractive. Pete is not very attractive. Tom is middle level and you are hot. So in this case, you might want to go for the two plus two version. You walk around on that wonderful beach in, the, in your bikini, and then you might pick, Tom might actually switch away from Kate towards you. So again, that little bit of information of, of the characteristic of each node changes your strategy of which house to choose. But now let me do something else. Let me change the types of relationships. Because up until this point, what I have done 
is I simply showed you the history of network science. Yeah? Starting from dots connected by black lines towards the strength of the knots, the, the strengths of the, uh, of, the, of the connections, the direction of the connections, and types of the different kind of uh, uh, vertices, the dots. But what is missing here, which is very characteristic to human societies, but not characteristic of an electrical network, is that the types, the relationship types vary in nature. So if I add only three basic types, blue will be friends, red is a romantic relationship, and green is a kin relationship, then suddenly this world between you and your three friends going on a romantic holiday is completely different. Because Tom and Kate are sisters, uh, siblings. They're very close to each other. Tom is a little bit into you, and you are into Tom as a friend. So this is going to be really awkward. And Kate is a little bit into Pete, and Pete is into Tom as a friend. So you will end up again changing the direction, the, the heart you are choosing, and you're going to cho choose the, the, the heart with the three ones. And if I just sit, do a very simple thing and look into your eyes, keep your my gaze, and I say, I love you, man. Let's assume that you are uh, a, a male in this case. Uh, then it will have a particular meaning. If I say, I love you, honey, I need another meaning. I say, I love you, brother, a third meaning. And actually, these meanings are not only learned, but are part of it is inherited. So we have an inherited package of regulating the social network around us and then regulating the types of social networks around us. So if I add one more thing, to this, and then let's say that we, I ask you to predict a new edge. Let's assume that there's going to be a holiday fling. It's either going to be Kate and Pete, or Julie and Pete. So Pete is going to get lucky. Which one do you think is more likely to have? Where is it going to be Kate and Pete the holiday edge, or is it, or is it going to be Julie and Pete the holiday edge? That one of them, Kate, is already into Pete. So you might as well say, well, Pete might be into, into Kate, and that's going to be, he will suddenly notice, notice Kate. There's going to be the new, the new uh, relationship. So Pete is going to choose Kate. But let's, let me just do one thing, recolor the lines, exactly the same directions, exactly the same width of the edges, but different colors. In this case, Tom and Kate are a strong couple, Julie uh, uh, is, likes Tom as a cousin. Tom likes Julie a little bit as a cousin. Kate is friends with Pete. And Pete, Kate would like to be friends with Pete, and Pete is friends with Tom, or would like to be friends with Tom. Clearly a completely different world. And your human ape mind already calculated that the relationship here is going to be between Pete and Julie, and definitely not between Kate and Pete. So, in other words, the relationship types matter. So we had a really interesting work that we looked at uh, now in two different societies. I'm going to see, show you one. Uh, we looked at mobile phone networks and we figured out how to, how to detect from mobile phone networks the basic types of relationships. Um, it's a very simple trick of, of, of adjusting uh, the ages of people. And what you would have here um, is uh, the number of calls is the first column, the number of uh, the average fraction of time of calls, the second column. The out in calls or who calls who is a third column, and the length of the calls is the fourth column. And we have identified mother, the first row, partner, romantic partner, the second row, the daughter, the third, father, fourth, Son is the fifth, and, and uh, same-sex best friend is the third. And I'd like you just now focus on a single thing here. Please focus on the relationship, uh, uh, and the uh, red line is always the caller, the ego that we're watching on the, on the mobile data phone set, is a woman, and, uh, and the blue line is a man. So please look at the... the uh, one, three, so the first row, third column 
in, out in curve. Yeah. So this is people calling them mom. Yeah. Look at the red line. So when you are calling, when you're a woman, and uh, yeah, then your mom, uh, when you're like 18, this is from 18 to 80s, um, 18 years old, your mom will be calling all the time. Yeah, there's gonna be something like this. Hey mom, no, fine, thank you, no, fine, bang, you put it down. I've got two teenagers at home, so I'm very aware of this. And these are going to be very short calls, yeah? So the, the, the graph next to it shows it's very short call. And then suddenly it starts going up. And at what at some age, you start calling your mom. So what is that age? So in this particular population, so this is age 30. What happens at age 30? This is a European population. It is age at first birth. You give birth. And then suddenly the phone calls are completely different. You're calling your mom. If you look at, on the right a little bit, more than uh, uh, much longer phone calls. It's like, hey mom, yeah, how was the TV? Yeah, no, I didn't watch it. No, no, did she? Right, wow. Uh, mom, can you come over and help with the kids looking after them a little bit? So it's completely different calls, yeah? So this is just a little illustration that actually these, we have a very varied relationship with our, our, our immediate social network, depending on the network edge type. So it will have some life course consequences, pattern how we go through life with them. But there's something else which is, which, is, which is the key what I want to show you here, that when you have two siblings, let's say I've got two brothers, brother A and brother B, I'm gonna be brothers, siblings with brother A for the rest of my life. And we're definitely siblings. So it's 100% probability. And I'm going to be brothers with brother B for the rest of my life, 100% probability. And hence, by definition, they are also going to be brothers to each other. This is how brothers work. So we will have a closed triangle at 100% probability, which is stable. Let's say I've got two friends, X and Y. I'm friends with X for now, but you know, who knows how long it lasts. And I'm friends with Y, who knows how long it's gonna last, but we are not friends. But they are less than 100% probability going to be friends with each other. So that means that we are going to have a much less likely to have a, a close triangle. So let's, let's look at the two examples. In the example A, you have a bunch of siblings, uh, five siblings, they're all connected to each other. And everyone, every person here has five connections. Yeah, so if you count it around the lines around any dot, it's five lines. The B graph is about friendship, well, stylized. Everybody has the same number of, of lines around each dot. Everybody has five connections but they're not connected to each other. So the degree in both of these, in network parlance, you know, the, net, the, 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 the number of edges is exactly the same five. But the clustering coefficient, the number of close type, the proportion of close type triangles around the maximum possible uh, number of triangles is 50%, it's a very high, very highly clustered network. And then the second one is zero. So this has a, a deep consequence for our societies. Uh, okay, let me just uh, uh, okay, let me just jump over this because, of course, I speak much slow, slower than I want to, and I just want to show you uh, this. What happens? What happens to society when we change the relationship types in a uh, for for everybody? The frequency of relationship types change. So, what happens to society when you everybody used to have a lot of family around, so everybody could populate their social network, and suddenly there's not enough family around, and you are going to populate the social network with friends. Yeah. Exactly the same transition. You are going to move from a highly clustered social network to a low clustered social network. It's going to be very important, because why wouldn't you have the fam family around? Because fertility is falling, 
So in 1960, the average fertility for the global po population for our species was 5.2 kids per woman. It already was going down. And today is 2.5. This is for the global average. And in 1960, the average urbanization level was around 33 and 34%. And now it's about 55%. So that it, you don't have enough family around, and even if you have, you can't get access to them. It's not only less, less the problem for in an urban setting about the, your siblings, but more about the second degree cousins. They're just wipe, wipe away. So here's a little simulation of what happens to the, to the clustering coefficient, which is the y-axis here. As you move from a rural, high fertility, no migration society, uh, which is uh, the x-axis here is the availability of relatives, to the urban, low fertility, migratory society. And what you see here is that you have a very high clustering coefficient in rural, rural settings, which goes down all the way down. Basically, you have a disappearing clustering coefficient. And this will be very important. The reason is because our species has solved, has a very special solution to organizing collective action. Like every ant, we like to co collaborate with our relatives. This is Bill Hamilton's inclusive fitness realization that if you, to the extent we have shared genes above the population average, we might want to call up, it, it pays evolutionary, evolutionary it pays to collaborate with them, even if it's costly. But we have another solution, which is a very primate solution, that we build relationships based on reciprocity. So we don't need to be friend, uh, relatives to, to collaborate with each other. We can just simply build a reputation with each other. Also, Bill Hamilton's and, and, and Rob Axelrod's um, uh, finding. And when you do that in, in, in a dyad between two people, it's reciprocity. When you do it in a network, it is going to be a network reputation. When you are managing your network reputation constantly, and we do this all the time. If you think about the next time, last time you spoke to your friends, for a while, you know, on, especially these days on, on Zoom or Skype, you would was, you was first discuss, oh, what's going, what's going on with you? Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, what's going with me? This is, uh, and then you almost predetermined, you will likely to go down all the shared friends, say, oh, what about this guy? Oh, he had a, a, a new baby, crazy the name they gave to this baby. And that was, oh, we, we constantly monitor people around us, yeah? So that means that to the extent we have a high clustering coefficient, a lot of shared friends, there is this reputation monitoring going on. And hence, once you have high clustering coefficient, you have high trust in the society. When, when you stop having key networks, which is what every traditional society is having to organize collective action, like the way the Unokai example at the very beginning. When you stop having these very highly clustered key networks because you ran out of relatives, because fertility fell, because of migration or urbanization, then suddenly the clustering, clustering coefficient goes down and trust in society goes away. We tested this hypothesis on, on data from Chile and, um, uh, on mobile phone, mixed mobile phone and census data. And what we found is that, so this is a little bit of a complicated graph. Uh, the the, the x-axis is the number of siblings people have, um, and the uh, y-axis is the number of close triangles uh, people have. These are This is mobile phone uh, uh, data. And uh, the number of siblings uh, is a bit of a weird uh, measurement. Um, uh, but it's not a, not a too bad a measurement of the fertility because uh, you know you really want to know your your parents' generation's fertility, uh, and you would want to know beyond just your immediate parents. But it's probably not a, not a problem. It's not a bad proxy. So what you see here is as for every line, I will tell you a second what the lines are. Uh, for every line, uh, they are going up. So the higher number of siblings you have, the higher number of triangles you end up having in your social network. 
uh, and this is true for if you if you control for the number of connections as well. The the color is the level of urbanization in your comuna. Chile has 324 comunas, and we we have data on the level of of um, of um, uh, urbanization within the comuna. The darkest line is the most rural community. The the yellowest line is the most urban community. So this is evidence for for how the triangles, so the number of triangles around you are going to be changing with uh, falling falling clustering coefficient and and uh, uh. right, so this is evidence that supports this this um, this this observation that today we are having we need to have a new form of of uh, uh, solution to this problem of collecting key networks. Even though we have this inherited drive to build our social networks, in a way that it ends up highly clustered, we are ending up uh, with a low clustering society and. And the, the solution is that we replace friends in a particular manner. We choose friends who are very similar to us. Sometimes it's going to be a club. Sometimes it's going to be a, a unit of action. Sometimes it's going to be a marker. But we constantly choose to look for these. So if you go and say, um, hey, uh, can you come over tonight, please? Uh, we're having a dinner party and there is this amazing person I want you to meet. You're gonna get on like house on fire. What I'm really saying, can you please drop a connection and that other person also drop a connection? So you become a connection with each other and my clustering connection with them. So we have a, a range of these solutions that we engage with. Uh, and, and one of the side effects of this is that this whole thing might explain uh, fundamentalism as sort of a transition process. So as we go from a macro level change, like changing demographic variables, an individual adaptive response to that, and that then increase, increases, uh, that creates macro level consequences, the rise of law, the rise of legal institutions, but also fundamentalism as sort of an in-between process for, for a shift. Uh, have I finished on time? This is it, yes. Uh, uh -huh. I can go come back to this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tomas. Uh, that was, um, I wish we could have had you for three times as long because I think uh, your style is first of all fantastic. I'm sure everybody agrees. Uh, I, I suppose my, my first question, because we, uh, I'm waiting to see if anything pops up on the YouTube uh, stream. Um, working in groups, living in groups is hard. I'm going to come to this in my talk, but it's really hard. Why do we do, you know, you talk about inclusion fitness and, but, but this is hard. I don't, I don't know why we do it. I, I, it, the, the, the problem you pose makes it seem even harder still. Um, the example you started with seemed pretty, pretty rough to begin with, but yeah. it doesn't seem to have got easier or better. So I mean, you know, why do we do this is the question. Um, so much of of our discussion is focusing on, on, on how, what kind of solutions we are going to have to live in a large group. So we have, you know, I mean, chimpanzee groups, the largest ever recorded chimpanzee group was 200 individuals. And those guys were warring with a neighboring chimpanzee group. And the second they warned, which is in human terms was a genocide because they killed everybody. Uh, then they split up again. Uh, bonobo groups are 40 individuals. Most chimpanzee groups are 45-ish individuals. And we live in this, I mean, uh, you know, hunter-gatherers live somewhere between 60, 80, and 200 uh, groups of fish and food version is difficult to measure. But, you know, arguably, we now live in a 7.8 billion person uh, so single society. So why? <laughs> Uh, even to the point, and we have so many discussions. We have this large brains, too expensive. We have all these engagement in language that allows us a synchronization on complex synchronization on a large group, you know, and hence, you know, we might choke to death by swallowing a berry. What? What kind of evolution is this? Clearly there's a trade-off. Uh, you know, we put our babies down and sometimes they buy, die in code death because something goes wrong with this, with this bit. Uh, of, of, that allows us to speak. 
uh, we have these really complex behaviors of community building behaviors. You know, we tell, tell supernatural stories. We have these, we engage in weird things of sharing food with each other in our large groups. Yeah, we build communities. We regulate inequality. We have so many things that are consequences of having living in a large group. But so rarely do we ask exactly the question you just asked. Why are we living in large groups? It's hard work. Yeah. And so I have a favorite. Uh, uh, I don't think that science have where we are now. I don't think we have a consensus around this. Uh, what are I think of as, as my current favorite uh, uh, version of the several different hypotheses is that when you have war, war is something very specific. Because if you have, I can't draw now, but uh, so if you have an optimal point, optimal group size for the, the given to, your, to the ecological environment that you're living in, then, then, then so let's say that, is this your left? That's my left. That's well right. done. Great. Okay, that's, that's your left. So let's say that this is the curve, so it's an S-shaped curve of how much you're going to get, how much the group is going to get when the x-axis is the number of people in it. So it's going to be like this. Yeah. So if you divide it by the number of people in it, so number of agents in it, so it's going to be like this, yeah? up and then slowly down. Yeah? So that's going to determine, there's going to have an an optimal point. Yeah, whereas peaking is going, going to optimal group size. So why on earth would this optimal group size increase in a gradual fashion in which you would get constant pressure that would trigger the rise of evolved uh, coping mechanisms towards a larger group? And one possibility is intergroup conflict. So when your niche is determined by the other groups, if you, if you manage to be a little bit more efficient, then this shifts this curve a little bit, which will means that you will wipe out the others. Uh, and, then, and then suddenly you're competing again with, with people who, have, who are similar to you. And hence the optimal one is always, optimal point always also shifts a little bit. So that would explain how we would get this really weird set of continuous push, but also might explain a really weird behavior surrounding uh, intergroup conflict. Uh, that we are so gentle, so very peaceful within our groups, and so super aggressive, bloodily super aggressive uh, across the across the groups. So that might be the reason. That is, that's, that's, that's my current, current explanation, why that might have happened. I'm going to end with an anecdote, which I actually wanted to start with because it comes to exactly that point. I start my day with my four children screaming and shouting at each other because they had decided to play together nicely. They were friends, they were in group. And all of a sudden they decided that somebody had taken the wrong toy and they wanted that toy and all of a sudden became extremely violent. And I think that what you have just said sounds exactly right because I think developmentally we see a similar pattern of learning how to switch between these two modes of you know absolute harmony and absolute destruction um, at the flick of a switch um, because it, we only have these two modes either you know we are together or we're not and I thought it was very interesting that you said that that large group of uh, primates went from you know sticking together as a group of did you say 400 or 200 I meant to try and remember that number the largest group the, the largest was around 200 yeah. individuals and then dispersed you know so the idea that these connections are dynamic they you, you can you can stick together and then uh, disperse so I, I did want to end with that anecdote and we can continue speaking but uh, for the live stream everybody needs to go and have their lunch I hope that you will uh, continue to join us uh, when we start again at 1 30 CET that time it's been wonderful having you speak thank you for your wonderful presentation, which got us all thinking, I hope. And uh, we may or may not have, uh, yeah, we have tons of questions uh, coming up on the stream now uh, from Bahar Tung Jang, from Liam Cross, uh, one of our other speakers. So, Hi, Bahar. Yeah, maybe you can hop onto the YouTube and, uh, and uh, answer the questions there, unless people don't mind us carrying on, which maybe they won't. I will They're just give you right. I'm happy to stick around. Great, so uh, Bahar says, uh, one question, reflecting their high need for care, infants show a lack of selectivity when approaching potential caregivers. 
what does this say about how inherited or learned bonding with kin versus friends is? Okay. Uh, can you repeat it? So infants yeah, will have a, a lack of selectivity given the caregivers. Or yeah, they, basically they, they sort of go to anyone, which I don't necessarily think is true, but this is the question. And she says, what does this say about how inherited or learned right. bonding with kin versus friend is? Right, right. So Bahar would probably know more about this than I do. Uh, um, so the Westermark effect is, I do not know, and I think Bahar probably knows, uh, uh, the Westermark effect to the extent it works with parents. I mean, it definitely works with siblings. Uh, and, you know, we are just one of several species in which, in which the skin recognition works. And it's been shown, um, I mean, this is so interesting. Can I hope back something? Because I, there's something that sort of speaks a little bit to this in my, in my talk. Ahead, yeah, jump absolutely. Is that okay? Ahead, I, is that, yeah, absolutely. Bahar, do you mind? Uh, let's hope that she doesn't mind either. Baha doesn't mind. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, uh, Liam Cross also has a question for you uh, while you're finding your slides. He says, thanks for the interesting talk. I had a question about the Europe Calls study, um, particularly the bottom right cell, for I think it was for the cell for same sex calls. There seemed to be a big drop for females at around 50. And he wants to know if he knew okay. why. Okay, okay. So this is, this is, um, this is, um, so I, I, I'm messing around a little bit with this idea of what is happening when we shift from a, a, a kin group to a friendship group, the logic of kin group. Yeah? And then one, you know, so here's, here's how you build a kin network. Yeah? So every hu traditional human society is coordinating social uh, uh, action, collective action on kin groups, that's one of our tricks, yeah? So we combine the inclusive fitness solution and we combine the reputation of network solution on to kin networks, like really smart. So this is how we, you build a kin network. And but just jumping ahead, and that is why, that because we are arranging in the kin networks, that we are in trouble when suddenly the kin networks fall apart. So this is what you would. So let's say that there is a, a mummy and a puppy and there are three kids. Yeah, this is like a very modern family. Right? So just for simplicity, otherwise it's going to be six. Uh, okay, so, and everybody is like this in the society. So, so you have this, uh, this world in which there are a lot of families and all of them, two parents, three kids. So you could actually assume that the parents are also connected to each other, yeah? So you end up with this, with this particular pattern in which uh, you sort of need some kind of parent recognition, yeah? So uh, whether, yeah, so, yeah, so this assumes, this network assumes that, that you have Westermark level sibling recognition in the parents' generation, in the kids' generation, and you have uh, a parent-child recognition as well. And, and I guess it would be murkied up a bit if kids would regularly en masse be brought up and connect, bonded with non-parent or with several parents. Uh, there is some hunting gatherer data. I think Bahar knows better uh, than I do, but I, I know that there's some hunting gatherer data that shows that adoptions tend to be within families, and not only hunting gatherer, actually traditional uh, pastoral societies as well. Uh, and then you can actually delete. So, so from this, you can delete the parents, and you can switch to this graph, in which there are three kinds of edges. These are all. Uh, sibling edges or uh, edges of relatives, direct relatives. So there are no final relatives here. Uh, the red ones are siblings. The blue ones are, are um, uh, first degree cousins. And the green ones are red second degree cousins. So now it's, you ended up with a, with, a, with a graph in which we have three ki different kinds of relatives based on the shared number of great, great grandparents. 
And that would allow us actually, let me just run ahead this. Uh, no, uh -huh. it's not in this graph. But anyway, so this then allows us to, to discuss what is happening when you start running out of shared relatives. And amazingly, if you have two different kinds of logic, so one of the kinds of logic is that you are tracking the network. So you're, you want to track the network, but the network is based, based on these social network edges. Then the relatedness, the number of shared great grandparents will be a really useful measure of your social network distance of the shared number of social connections. So if you're meeting somebody new in a high fertility society and you say, well, we are sharing uh, eight, whatever, let's say two um, of, the, of the 16 possible great, great, great grandparents, it will give you a piece of information of how many possible shared social, social connections you're going to have. And then hence we'll give you a piece of information of how likely this person is going to cheat on you. And hence, tracking the social network is going to be really important. But in, 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 in our field of evolutionary anthropology versus often versus social anthropology, there is this battle, yeah? The battle is, is this evolutionary concept, is the kin natural concept, is it an evolution concept or is it a, a cultural concept? And on one hand, evolutionary anthropologists point out, look, all of these red lines are based on Western market connections. So you build this network based on Western mark connections, obviously, obviously this is an evolved behavior. And then to which social anthropologists say, oh gee, you know what? You can construct kinship. Here's a fine infinite list of societies doing that. So I think that this particular explanation is a solution where we are really, what is happening is that we have these Western mark connections, which are stable, we stay for, with us all the time. And in high fertility societies, tracking the kinship, tracking the relatedness is act, ends up a network heuristic. And this is what changes when fertility falls, when urbanization falls, yeah? urbanization rises, when we, we start migration, because suddenly we, there are not enough relatives. So we re replace the relatives with friends. And the way then we are start building a social network is going to be based on similarity, a completely different logic. So in a high, high, high fertility society, uh, rural society, similarity doesn't help you at all assessing whether somebody is going to be having a high connection towards you. What you want to know is the, is the relatedness because it's going, to be, uh, it's going to give you a network heuristic. In a low fertility urban society, actually relatedness will not help you. What will help you is similarity or whether you belong to the same club. And that will be a, a guiding post. So if you think about it, this actually completely rethinks or rewires the whole fake news phenomenon, yeah? Because suddenly the fake news phenomenon might be a simple little uh, local level, level adaptive behavior, just trying to maintain a high fertility, high, high clustering <coughs> in, a, in a high clustering local network uh, in, a, in a low fertility urban society. I'm anyway. going to bring this session to a close, Mars. I yes, do apologize, yeah, I, I but I just want to, to 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 do that. I'm going to say that if I took away, um, you know, an important word there was similarity, and in our previous talks we talked about reliability. So one thing for you all to go and think about right now, because we talked about low-level sensory motor synchronization to to begin with, and now we're talking about a slightly higher level view of things. But maybe we've been talking about a similar idea: similarity and predictability. That's your homework for lunchtime. Thank you so much, Tomasz, for your talk, for your extra time to the people who've been...